Good evening, everyone. Thank you for participating in this evening's ASORN IQ webinar, Identifying and Managing Unhappy Patients with Ann Menke. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements. The audio and visual portions of this presentation are the sole and exclusive property of the American Society of Ophthalmic Registered Nurses and the presenter. You may not reproduce or rebroadcast any portion of this presentation to any third party without the express written consent of ASORN and the presenter. You also may not give away, sell, or share the content herein. Nursing contact hours are provided by the American Society of Ophthalmic Registered Nurses. ASORN is accredited as a provider of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. ASORN is provider approved by the California Board of Registered Nursing, CEP number 11901. One nursing contact hour will be awarded after completion of the webinar. Participants must attend the entire webinar to receive credits. Credit for a course hour will be denied to individuals who miss more than 15 minutes of the hour. After the webinar, live attendees will be redirected to an evaluation survey page. Attendees viewing the recording should follow the survey link they receive in their confirmation email. All attendees must complete the evaluation in order to receive credits for the webinar. An attendance verification form will be sent to you by December 4, 2014. ASORN's planning committee members and staff have disclosed that they do not have any conflicts, conflicts of interest related to this activity, and our speaker, Ann Mankey, also has no financial conflict to disclose. All lines will be muted throughout the presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat function, which is located at the lower left corner of your screen, and questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation as time permits. Finally, I would like to introduce our speaker, Ann Menke. Ann received her diploma in registered nursing from Christ Hospital School of Nursing, her BA from San Francisco State University, and her MA and PhD from Harvard University. Dr. Menke draws upon nine years of clinical nursing, 15 years in academics, and 17 years in healthcare risk management. She provides confidential risk management consultations to ophthalmologists, conducts research and writes articles on ophthalmic clinical and risk management topics, directs the content of the Omic Digest and writes the hotline column and lead articles, and presents risk management seminars at national, state, and subspecialty ophthalmic conferences as well as ASORN and JACAPO meetings. Please join me in welcoming Ann Mankey. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, welcome to the folks who are giving up their evening to uh, hopefully learn something that will be useful. I really appreciate you taking time to listen to the webinar. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, not only in the healthcare field, but I find that dealing, recognizing and dealing with unhappiness uh, is, a, is a daily issue sometimes. As Caitlin mentioned, I have no financial disclosures. So I regularly develop new courses, uh, and this one I was asked to develop. And when I was asked, I realized it was uh, something we really needed to do. We have a confidential risk management hotline for our policyholders, and I get a lot of calls about this topic. And what I noticed from the calls is that sometimes it takes a long time for you to realize a patient is unhappy. Other times it's clear they're unhappy, but you're not managing the unhappiness as well as you could. And sometimes you're working on trying to make somebody happy that you're never going to be able to make happy. So I think that there's a lot to be learned in this topic. And I'm going to dive right into some actual uh, malpractice cases that are going to form the basis of the webinar. So the first case is a patient who had a retinal detachment and was referred to an ophthalmologist by another ophthalmologist. The physician explained to the patient in the office that she could have surgery right away there in the office, or they could schedule her for surgery in the hospital. And she opted to have a pneumatic retinopexy in the office. But unfortunately, as we know, sometimes detachments recur, and she ended up needing two more vitrectomies. So she ended up for, with a total of three procedures, and despite that, she only had light perception at the end of those procedures. As might be expected, she was very discouraged about this. And often uh, patients, no matter how well the informed consent process is carried out, they still have to, I guess, believe that it's going to be beneficial in order to decide to go ahead with the surgery. 
So after everything was done and they told her, you know, that they weren't recommending any more procedures, she really thought about the whole process of care and decided to sue the physician and the physician's group. And what's helpful to us is she sent a letter, which usually doesn't happen, but she sent a letter sort of detailing what she was so unhappy about. So let's take a look at some of that. So one of the first complaints she mentioned in her letter was that the physician told her he was just working her in on the first day. Now, we know that working somebody in means that you're maybe going to miss your lunch, you're going to have to stay late, that you're really going all out to accommodate a patient with an urgent or emergent condition. But she didn't understand what that meant, but it made her feel like she wasn't really welcome. The other thing is that she felt that the, the surgeon's tone and his facial expression made her decide that he felt she was taking too long to decide. During the procedure, she claimed now in her letter, but never said anything earlier, that her pain was so severe that she cracked two teeth. Now, the last bullet point here is really important because while she was having this extraordinary amount of pain and obviously was very frightened, the staff happened to be having a party, and she could hear them joking and laughing while she was having a lot of pain. So it's not surprising she was unhappy. What's surprising is she didn't say anything. When her detachment recurred, uh, no longer could she be, um, you know, have her procedure done in the office, so she was admitted to the ambulatory surgery center. And when she got there, the schedule had changed, and she ended up having to wait for hours. And she was there with her mother, who was elderly. And again, you can imagine the stress if you've ever had surgery yourself. But first, you want to be the first procedure in the morning, and certainly you don't want to wait. Well, the nurse came up and talked to her while she was waiting and just, you know, to make conversation said, oh, have you had this procedure before, meaning a vitrectomy? And um, the patient said, yes, I had it done in the office. Well, the nurse was certainly a member of ASORN, and she knew that you didn't have vitrectomies in the office, and so she said to the patient, oh, that, that can't be true. You couldn't, you had to have come to an operating room to have it. So the patient then also felt that nobody believed her. Uh, and meanwhile, she claims that she heard the nurse go over and talk to the surgeon about her comment that she had had this in the office, and the surgeon said, these people don't realize how much it costs to do surgery in the hospital. So then she felt really insulted because she was paying for her own care and was very insulted that someone would assume she was a charity case. So you can kind of see this is going from bad to worse, but we're not done yet. So as I mentioned, she needed another vitrectomy, and they were waiting for the authorization. And as happens, the authorization request got lost on the surgeon's desk, and her surgery was delayed for several months. So looking back on this, it's hardly surprising that the patient was really unhappy. But after she thought about everything, her conclusion was if they had only done the procedure in the hospital instead of the office, she would have been fine. Now, that's not the case. We know, uh, you know, we, those of us in the eye profession know that these detachments can recur, but that was her conclusion that she was not welcomed, was rushed into a decision, made the wrong decision, and then lost vision in her eye. In medical malpractice lawsuits, you have to find uh, an expert in the field to criticize the care. So in this case, it would have been an ophthalmologist. And uh, unusually, the, she could not find an expert. So the defense uh, filed what's called a motion for summary judgment, where instead of going to a jury trial, a judge has to make the decision. So each side submits a brief where they explain their case, and the judge sided with the defense. So from the physician's perspective and OMIC's perspective, this was a good outcome. The case closed without payment. So let's talk about risk management. My job as the risk manager is to see if I can't help prevent claims. So I looked back and thought about, well, what was missing in this encounter between this physician and patient? What did she really want? How did the practice and physician respond? And what might have worked better? So let's look at that. Like many uh, patients, this patient um, assumed that the doctors she was going to were qualified. But what she really wanted, studies have shown, is to know that they cared about her. And she came to the conclusion that they didn't care about her. So it didn't matter to her that they were technically qualified. She wanted them to act like a human being, and they didn't. 
the physician was completely surprised by this lawsuit and um, looked back on his care and looking at it from a clinical perspective, he felt that he had managed her retinal condition appropriately. And he really didn't feel like there was anything wrong with how he had communicated with her or his style of communicating with her. And while I don't think he did anything wrong, I think that there are learning opportunities here. Uh, and so I was looking for ways to help identify when someone like this is unhappy before they file a lawsuit. And one of the solutions I found is in a book I'm going to recommend. I don't get any <laughs> anything for recommending this book, but I, I seriously think it's a, it's a great book. It's called Crucial Conversations. And the little triangle to the left of your screen talks about the three elements that make a normal conversation a crucial conversation. So um, I had one of these recently. Uh, I was watching the World Series with my sister who was visiting from Ohio, and obviously her team wasn't in on it. And she said something to me that I was very tense about the game, and I didn't think that her comment was very funny. She was laughing at me, and so I said, well, I don't think that's very funny. And we were off to the races. What I didn't realize is that there were strong emotions. Opposing opinions, I didn't know there were any opinions to be had. I mean, everyone should be a Giants fan, right? Um, and it turned out that this was a high-stakes conversation. Uh, we didn't really speak again except, uh, you know, a few words here or there until she left. And I realized that the skills I'm going to talk to you about from this book, I could have used them in that. So any conversation, any day can go from, you know, something fun to something really tense and difficult in a blink of the eye, to use an ophthalmology metaphor. <laughs> so the, the crucial insight for the, of this book for me and the reason I like it so much is because I work a lot in the patient safety realm. And they talk about safety in the book. And their insight was that if people don't feel safe, they communicate instead of using their, you know, lo, lo, their, their creativity, their insight, their compassion, they go into this ancient part of the brain and they only respond with either fight or flight or violence or silence, as this book calls it. This patient retreated into silence for quite a long time. She didn't tell anyone how unhappy she was. She didn't tell them about her teeth. She didn't say she was unhappy for waiting uh, or that she felt pressured to make a decision. And then she got very unhappy and in the terms of this book, resorted to violence. So, what the book goes on to say is that if we're feeling unsafe and we're in that fight or flight mode, we're trying to make sense of what's happening. And so we start telling ourselves stories. And we only have a couple. And none of them are particularly useful, but you probably recognize these. So if she felt like a victim, that horrible things were happening to her, and the villains were the doctor and the nurses, and she also felt helpless. She felt that there was nothing she could do. And so based on these stories that she was telling herself, she had a certain reaction, and if you're the one on the receiving end of this, you're going to have a reaction. And it's helpful to watch your thinking. And you may have all, all of these responses at once. So what are some examples in um, surgery centers or ophthalmology offices of events that can lead patients to become silent? Well, as this case shows, I think complications often do. I think patients are very stressed already to have eye surgery because they're very worried about blindness. And then if they have a complication, they're, they're very tense, they're very fearful, they may not feel comfortable asking questions. We've seen lawsuits when patients sue just because they were sent to a subsequent treater. Uh, you know, if, if the physician feels like he can't handle, for example, endophthalmitis, a general or comprehensive ophthalmologist will refer the patient to a retina specialist. Well, we've had patients sue over that because, again, they feel the physician doesn't care and that the physician is trying to get rid of them, and, and really the physician is trying to do her best. Delays and waits can either lead to silence or violence. Some patients are very vocal and angry about waiting, and others like this one said nothing. But I think behaviors that are really clear signs of retreating into silence or sort of disengaging from helpful communication are patients who don't come for their appointments, who refuse to follow the physician's recommendations, if we were all in a room together, I'd ask you for other examples, because I think the most obvious one is patients who don't pay their bills. Uh, you know, instead of saying, I'm angry um, that you didn't 
provide the care I wanted or I'm angry that this is the outcome I got, they just may not pay their bill and that may be the first sign that they're unhappy. So this patient, as I mentioned, felt both a victim and helpless and then told the villain story. But what was missing? What could have happened differently? Well, I think obviously, despite their best intentions to care for her, she didn't feel that they they understood what was going on. And the biggest problem was nobody knew that she was unhappy. So they couldn't show empathy. They couldn't respond to her fears if they didn't know she had them. So what are some solutions for this? Well, one of the suggestions is to invite input. Uh, and it shows the patient that you've noticed there's a problem. So if you're in an office and the patient's had a complication coming in for that first post-op visit, and um, you can just ask them, I see that you experienced a complication. How has this affected your recovery from the surgery? Or instead of getting angry, as we usually do when a patient misses an appointment, you could call and say, instead of saying, you missed your appointment with Dr. Jones, when are you coming back? Or you wasted our time, which is really the message we're giving. You could call and in a very caring voice say, you missed your appointment today. Are there any concerns you would like us to know about? I think that would be very welcoming to most patients. And while it may not immediately work, I think it sets a better tone than the way practices usually manage patients who miss appointments. Or again, I see that you need to see another doctor. Do you have any questions about why? There's a hospital near where I live that implemented this change. And every single person who goes into the patient's room at that hospital, whether it's the doctor, the nurse, the x-ray technician, the person cleaning the room, the person bringing the food, asks each patient before they leave the room, do you have any questions? Is there anything you need from us? And their sat patient satisfaction scores just skyrocketed. So I think that's a really good thing to think about asking patients each time. Let's go on to the second case. This is a patient who presented for refractive surgery LASIK and had the preoperative evaluation done by an optometrist and didn't meet the surgeon until the day of surgery. And you can, you're going to find out that that's not the best way to go about things. Immediately, at the, there was a complication called a buttonhole, so the procedure had to be stopped. And the ophthalmologist explained this to the patient and his wife and said, I, I need you to come in tomorrow. I want to see you. Well, unlike the first patient who didn't tell anybody until she sued, this patient immediately became angry and said to the doctor, I'm, there's no way. I'm not coming back to see you. I'm going to go back and see my optometrist. So we're in a different scenario here. Well. Just like the first patient, though, this patient went on to have a, a series of problems. So first, he had the buttonhole complication. So uh, you know, a little dip, part of his cornea was removed inadvertently. Then he developed a corneal abrasion. And if you've ever had one, these are extremely painful. And then my slide says he developed a second complication, but actually a third one, Sands of Sahara. And the optometrist said, look, this is really serious. You need to go back and see the ophthalmologist. And he again refused. This patient, though, eventually healed, didn't lose any vision, didn't have a scar, but not a happy patient, not a good experience. So he asked for his medical records. And to his surprise, when he read the operative note, which had been dictated before the procedure, he learned that he actually had a very good outcome and that there were no complications. Well, you can imagine the kind of anger he felt. And again, if you were in the room with me, I would be asking you, what did this patient think was going on? And it's the F word, fraud. I'm sure he felt that the patient lied in the medical record and was trying to cover up that there had been a problem. So he found an attorney, and the attorney looked at this, heard the patient's um, explanation, got the records from the optometrist, and said, sure, let's sue him. Well, during a lawsuit, if it goes far enough, uh, there's a formal um, process called a deposition where you swear to tell the truth. You're under oath. And if you lie, uh, it, it's perjury. So I just was reading about a case that uh, we won uh, at trial where during the deposition, the plaintiff, as you're called a plaintiff when you uh, uh, file a lawsuit, the plaintiff and the plaintiff's uh, medical expert said things in the deposition and then said opposite things uh, untruthful things during the trial. And so they were able to come back to their deposition testimony and, and show that they were perjuring themselves. So it, it did, they, we won the case. Anyway, when this physician was asked about that operative note, he said, you know, um, I, he, he did have a complication. This is not an accurate note. He said, and I actually dictated this beforehand. 
and I meant uh, to include a handwritten note, but I didn't get the chance. And he said, so you're right, the, uh, the medical record isn't accurate, but this was a known complication. I had told him that these things can happen, and uh, so I'm not willing to settle the case. And eventually, um, the plaintiff didn't have that smoking gun of fraudulent records, so they dropped the case. So it, as in the first case, we didn't have to pay any money. So let's ask the same questions. What was going on here? What was missing? What did this patient really want? And what might have worked better? So it's hardly a surprise that patients who meet their surgeon on the day of surgery have difficulty trusting the physician. And trust is so important in the physician-patient relationship. And if there is a complication, you have to work very, very hard to regain the patient's trust. We also know from studies that, and from our malpractice claims experience that if patients have more than one complication, which each of these two patients did, they, they lose faith in their physician. They may be willing to believe everything's okay for a while, but by the second, third, fourth complication, they're completely convinced that it's not their eye, it's the surgeon. And also, if their expectations are not met, they immediately think it's malpractice. Finally, the last point is really important. LASIK is an elective procedure, and it's by and large a cash-based procedure. And our claims experience shows that refractive and cosmetic patients are more likely to sue. I think they are more invested in their care because they've paid money, and they have higher expectations. And when they don't get what they want, they sue. So let's look at how the physician managed it. Right away, he explained the complication, so that's good. Uh, he told the patient what had happened. He told the patient what care he needed and asked the patient to come see him the next day. When the patient refused, he explained that his cornea needed to be monitored while he healed, while it healed. And so I think, from a, again, from a clinical perspective, I think the physician did a good job. The patient, however, felt like the surgeon was a villain, was very angry. And I think what happened is what was missing is at no point did the surgeon acknowledge that the patient, even men, <laughs> might have feelings about the surgery being canceled. And he never talked about the financial impact. So let's look at those two things. So this is an example of a patient with a violent or fight response. And these are patients who have high unmet expectations, cash investments, as I've mentioned. And you probably see plenty of these patients. They crowd the front desk. They, they're very vocal. They expect you to do what they want, and they want, want uh, what they want very quickly. And sometimes they get very loud. They may use profanity. They may start making threats. Um, so these patients are very frightening if you're the, the, the staff member faced with them. So the insight, again, of this book, Crucial Conversations, is to take both silence and violence as a sign that the, here, in our case, the patient, but the person you're in a conversation with is feeling unsafe. Normally, what we try and do, if, we're, if we even notice it, is we keep trying to finish the conversation. What the book says is step away from the content. Don't try and do what you were already doing. So at the first sign that this patient was feeling angry about the surgery, instead of continuing to explain that the cornea needed to heal and the, um, you know, that, that the patient needed to come back the next day, you have to stop and do something differently. You have to build safety, and we're going to talk about how to do that. The other recommendation is they said to be curious. And instead of um, immediately assuming that the person you're dealing with is a jerk, especially if they're getting angry and loud and using profane language, is to practice curiosity and say, well, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person do what this person is doing? The reason that that, that suggestion is so important is that if we're frightened by the patient's response or we're angry in response to the patient's response, we're operating in the same ancient part of the brain, that fight or flight mode, and no good solution is going to come from this. But if we ask ourselves a question, like why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person do what this person is doing, it engages a different part of your brain that is better able to uh, deal with complexity, to be much more creative, and it actually also calms your body down. When you're in fight or flight, there are a lot of stress hormones circulating, like cortisol, so that you can fight if you need to. And by getting your brain engaged in a different way, it's very calming for your body. So it's, it's a really good thing to do. And I think we don't have to think very hard about why this patient would be angry. 
And I think that what, what works to build safety here is to apologize. And what if the surgeon had said when he saw when the patient said, I'm not coming back to see you, just say, I'm really sorry your surgery had to be stopped because you had a complication. And what if he went on to say, I know you took off work and your wife did too and you used your savings to pay for the surgery. I imagine you're disappointed and perhaps angry. Again, what it says to the patient is, one, it's okay to be angry. It's a normal response. And I'm not going to get angry back at you because I understand why you're angry. And this brings up a point that happens not just with cosmetic or refractive surgery, but with premium intraocular lenses after cataract surgery. If for some reason, for example, you couldn't put the IOL in that the patient had paid for, you don't wait for the patient to ask for his or her money back. You say, I couldn't put the premium IOL in, so I'll refund the extra money you paid for it. And in this case, the surgeon, I think, should have immediately said to the patient, I'll refund your fees since you didn't have the surgery you paid for. Legally, he hasn't said, I messed up your surgery, so I'm refunding the money. There's no admission of liability. It's basically just saying, you've paid for something. You're not going to get what you paid for. And I think what this sets up is if the patient's eye heals well enough and he has the courage to go through it again, he's more likely to come back to the same surgeon and have the surgery. So it's it's a much better approach to something like this. When the patient said very angrily, I'm not coming back, I think you have to notice the unhappiness and say, you must be really unhappy with me if you don't want to come back again, and then wait for the patient to respond. You don't just rush on. Give the, the patient some uh, time to respond. And then again, as I mentioned in the first case, ask for input. Uh, I, okay, you're going to go to your optometrist. I understand you don't want to come back and see me. I'm happy to see you if you change your mind, but I just want to make sure you know to go to him. And before you know, I leave, do you have any questions for me? Is there anything else I can do to help? Let's go on to the third case. And by the way, if you do have questions as we go along, you're welcome to type those into the chat room, and I'll uh, watch them as we go, or we can wait till the end. So this case, you can see they're probably escalating in unhappiness. So this is a, an, another unhappy person was a new patient, had Medicare and secondary insurance, and was referred in and just had a complaint of blurry vision. So the ophthalmologist performed a comprehensive exam, including refraction. And if you have anything to do with billing in your office, you know that already this is a difficult situation. Why? Because most of the patients uh, that you're seeing, or many of them, are Medicare patients, as this patient is. And Medicare has decided, for reasons that are not clear to me, that refraction is not a covered benefit, even though you need refractions to get glasses, which are covered. So right away, it makes billing complicated, and it makes the decision-making practice complicated. This practice collected at the time of service, which is what Medicare tells you to do. At this time, CMS was trying to decide what they were going to pay for this service. And so they, they collected what they thought they would get, and then the extra money for the refraction. The patient used his credit card to pay, but when he got his explanation of benefits from Medicare, he canceled payment. He called the credit card company and canceled payment, and the practice called me and said, hey, what do we do? This patient has canceled payment. Um, how do we handle it? Well, the patient um, felt that the reason he gave for canceling the payment is that he decided that this was fraud. He, just, he realized that the benefit explanation explained that the surgeon was charging Medicare $245. The patient was told it was only going to be $149, and he thought, okay, they're going to get an extra $100 from every Medicare patient, and this is going to be just a phenomenal amount of money that they're going to get. Um, he also thought that they were forcing prepayment. He didn't understand that policy. He was used to other types of services where you get the service and then pay for it. So all in all, he was very un unhappy. But what he did about it was just extraordinary. He was so furious that he not only sent the letter to the credit card company, but he wrote to the State Director of Aging and Adult Services, the State Attorney General, the head of the Federal Health and Human Services, and even President Obama. I mean, he really went all out because he, he thought he had uncovered this great big scam. And more importantly, he threatened to contact the state medical board. Now, complaints to the Centers for Medicare Services, CMS, and to medical boards by law must be investigated. So 
So if he had contacted either one of those, these are formal things. They're very frightening because the physician's license is at stake. And so this was, you know, the patient was threatening to escalate it even more, and the practice actually called me for help. What they also learned um, that didn't make the situation any better was that, remember I said the patient had secondary insurance, it turns out that that would have covered the exam and they only needed to charge him for the refraction. So the practice wasn't getting anywhere with the patient and they actually asked the insurance company in a letter on which they sent a copy to the patient if they could explain to the patient about how the insurance worked, and the patient felt very insulted that he was described that way. He said, I have a name. You shouldn't call me the patient. I didn't give the practice, uh, you know, we couldn't think of anything to do other than to get the physician involved who was not yet involved. And once the physician got involved and apologized to the patient, remarkably, this guy calmed down, went away, and the physician never heard from the patient again. So again, this is the third example where it went away, but a lot of trouble. So when we asked the, the question about this patient, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person do what this person is doing? I mean, this is a different type of patient than either of the first two. You know, this, you know there, there was no harm to him, and he, wasn't, he ended up only being out the $45 that uh, he would have had to pay anyway for the refraction. So he was really, really angry. Um, so what do you think he really wanted, and what might have worked better? Um, I think he wanted to understand. You know, patients really get very confused, as we all do, about this insurance. And he didn't want to pay for something his insurance was going to cover. So I think that he was very upset about that. Uh, but he very, very, very quickly moved to not just anger, but suspicion of fraud and then action to maybe he thought he could be a whistleblower and he'd make a lot of money off this. I don't know. But what might have worked better? Oh, first, what did the practice do? Remember a few slides back I talked about the um, recommendations from the authors of Crucial Conversations is to step away from the content. Unfortunately, I was helping them give the wrong answers because I hadn't read the book yet. But we kept just trying to explain better how billing worked. And we didn't really focus in on what the patient really wanted. Um, it was a you know, good motive, but it wasn't helpful. I think what they needed to do was not just acknowledge how angry he was, just as with the LASIK patient who had the complication, but to also directly speak to his sense of injustice and his allegation of fraud. So here's some suggested language. You seem very angry, and I can understand why. You think we're not being honest with you or the insurance company about the fees. I think if somebody had said this to him, and just directly address the fact that he thought that they were engaging in fraud, it would have, again, just sort of taken him aback, saying, wow, they're willing to talk to me about this. It shows how professional they are, and it shows, again, that it's okay to be angry and to, to question the bill, even if you do it pretty forcefully. Now, let's say that the patient said, oh, wow, you're right. I do think it's, you're, you're being unfair, and, you know, um, that made me really angry. And let's say he calmed down pretty quickly. Then you could say, I'd like to answer your questions about the bill and explain our billing process. Would that be okay? If he says yes, then you go on. But if he gets angry again, which he may, some patients you've probably seen, really takes a long time to calm down. Um, and so he may need to talk about this some more. So then you just, again, acknowledge the unhappiness. You're still upset with us. What can I do to help? So I'm going to go over for a few slides here what happens if somebody stays angry. So again, the, the big insight of the book is notice the anger and stop trying to do your job. So until you deal with the anger, the patient's not going to hear anything you have to say anyway. And so I think you have to just stay and talk with this patient. Now, I gave this course once to uh, medical uh, folks who are, who are on the front lines on the offices making the appointments. And they had just come from training that said that they had a time frame in which they had to schedule the appointment and move on to the next caller. And I was telling them to do something that was going to take a lot of time. And so I then met with their uh, bosses and said, you know, I think what would work better is if they encounter a patient who's really unhappy, they send you some kind of note saying, hey, I've got a live one or I've got somebody who's really an unhappy camper. I'm going to stay and help this person as long as I can. So 
instead of saying, oh my gosh, I've got three minutes to schedule this appointment, you say to yourself, this patient's upset. My job is to listen. And again, take that deep breath and try and really hear what they're saying. Uh, some of this advice, by the way, came from Google. So we'll see if you agree with all of it. Uh, next thing is stay calm. Anger is really hard to handle, so watch if you're getting upset. Take deep breaths, relax your muscles, and give the patient the gift of your attention. I think people really know if we're hanging in there with them and really listening. Really important not to take it personally. Most likely, you've, you know, you've never met this person or spoken to him or her before. You certainly did nothing to upset them. And again, just keep telling yourself, this person does not feel safe. I need to create safety. So that, again, you're using better parts of your brain instead of just giving back as good as you get. It may take some time, and you may not, this may be the biggest challenge. I know how, uh, how pressed for time offices and surgery centers are, but it's really important to give this patient the sense of time to finish up. And acknowledge that the patient is saying something, and just say, go on, or I see, or tell me more. Sort of let them know you're listening and that you know, you're, you're going to give them the time they need. And stay patient. The longer the patient talks and vents, the more time they have to calm down. And again, they may need to tell their story three or four times and hear you say, oh, yes, I understand. Oh, that, that must have really upset you uh, before they're able to, to go. If you can't help them, some people just can't back off. Uh, and maybe this patient wouldn't have backed off. You know, maybe he needed to write all those letters and really vent his anger. So if you're not getting anywhere, let somebody know that it's not working and that you obviously haven't been able to work it out and don't have the solution. So you need to get help. This is where, the one where I'm wondering how you feel about this advice. Um, this was the one I got off the internet. What, consider ending the content, contact. rather. So what can you say to somebody that you're basically going to hang up on? <laughs> You know, how do you do this professionally, but you know, you're not getting anywhere, you don't want to take any more time. So here's some suggestions that were on, web, on the line. You seem very upset. Would you prefer to continue this conversation via email? I'm sorry you're up so upset. Would you like to call us back when you're calmer? And I apologize, but if you continue to use that language, I'll have to end the call. Personally, the, I, the first one, I don't think that would help me. The second one, I would feel insulted. But the third one, I think I would feel comfortable using that language. Uh, I apologize, but if you continue to use that language, I'll have to end the call. So the, the real important thing is to find something to say that you feel you could say in a difficult situation and feels authentic. So we're going to go to our last one. This patient um, is a very long-term patient and really difficult. Nobody really knew how to handle this situation. This was somebody who regularly called to say that they had an urgent problem, they insisted on being seen immediately, but they would show up hours early and while in the waiting room, very loudly keep telling everybody else, I have an emergency, they won't see me. And obviously very distressing to the other patients, to the physicians, to the practice. When he finally got in to be examined, all he said was, my eyes don't feel right. He had no pain, no infection, no trauma, and there was never any measurable visual change. So from the physician's perspective, they didn't, they, they didn't think anything was wrong. The staff knew what was happening, and they really tried very hard to calm him down. They offered him refreshment, but their assessment of it was the drama in the waiting room happens every time. And this was really disheartening. As soon as they walked in and saw this person on the schedule, they knew what kind of day they were going to have, and it threw everything off. It's also you know, a patient safety concern because if you're distracted by a patient like this, you're not paying the, same, the right amount of attention to the patients you are seeing. You may feel rushed, you're distracted. It, it it's, makes it unsafe for everybody. So why would this patient be acting this way? Why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person keep calling, saying that their eyes didn't feel right, insist on being seen, you know, yell in the waiting room every time, time after time after time. So what did this person really want and what might have worked better? How did they handle this? So I'm not sure what this patient wants. I can tell you when I've given the course before, every single time, the first uh, thing the audience says is this patient wants attention. 
And I don't think that's really what's going on. And also, I don't think that this is an eye condition. This patient's had a lot of exams, and the physician has never been able to find anything. So I, I, I don't think that there's an eye condition that's just not been diagnosed yet. Unlike the first three where there were problems with communication, often on both sides, I don't think this is about just communication. And in fact, my uh, armchair diagnosis is anxiety disorder. I think this patient was anxious beyond the normal amount of anxiety and just not able to cope with concerns about the eye, waiting. But you may see patients with other kinds of um, mental health issues, either cognitive impairment, they may have dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, they may have substance abuse. I got a call last week from a practice where a patient came in just so drunk and obnoxious and then just started threatening violence. You know, that's a hard person to have to deal with. I think the practice did a really good job trying to handle the anxiety, and I think they were very responsive. But here was the staff members who felt helpless because they just didn't know what to do going forward. So what was missing in this encounter? I think the practice needed to take some action. I needed, think they needed to address the, the issue and set some limits. So let's look at some suggestions on how to do that. Just like we acknowledged the anger earlier, I think they have to address the anxiety here and say, you seem to become anxious when you wait for your appointment. What can we do to help? Now, if it was just about anxiety waiting to be seen, they could offer the patient the first appointment in the morning or right after lunch. But he thinks there's something wrong with his eye, and there isn't. So I don't think this is going to solve the repeat calls. So I think they have to address the repeat behavior and say this, and this I think is the physician who has been absent so far, has to say to the patient in, in all sincerity, I think yeah, you can't be sarcastic, you know, but say with great empathy, I know it feels like something's wrong with your eye. But just like the last three visits, I wasn't able to find anything to explain what's happening. And then the physician, I think, has to address the behavior in the waiting room. When you tell other patients we won't see you, it's upsetting to them and to us. Then I think you have to go on and say what you expect from the patient. Uh, we'll try to schedule you first in the morning, but when that's not possible, we expect you to wait quietly until you're called for your appointment. And then advise the patient of the consequences. You told other patients today three times that we won't see you. If this happens again, we may need to discharge you from the practice. And I think there are times when you have to do this. I think there are times when you can't help somebody. But one last thing that you need to do before you just discharge the patient from the practice is to realize that while this isn't an eye condition, there's something going on here. And so whether it's a psychiatric condition, cognitive impairment, substance abuse, the ophthalmologist needs to refer the patient to the primary care physician for a, an evaluation. Uh, these are all medical conditions, and so these patients have to be treated with compassion and respect, and you have to realize that you can't, you, you know, you can't fix this problem in an ophthalmology office. And this is the example of when to, knowing when to stop. Uh, sometimes patients need more than you can be, provide, and sometimes nothing you do is ever going to make them happy, and sometimes for if they're too disruptive, you have to discharge them from the practice. So examples of when to stop are repeat problem behaviors that keep going despite a, a sincere effort to address them, escalating behavior, or patients who become disruptive. You can't just discharge a patient without notice. It's customary to give a 30-day notice in writing to the patient if you're going to discharge them from the practice, and the only exception is violent patients. And we have sample protocols and sample letters on our website. So I just thought I'd get, give you the outcome of this. Um, after talking, presenting this course, and the physician uh, who had this patient was there in the audience, we talked. And she recognized that the patient did have a lot of anxiety, and she wanted to do what she could to allay that. And she decided to offer the patient regularly scheduled appointments uh, so that before the patient got overly anxious to just see the patient and see if there was a problem. And that seemed to work so far. Uh, you know, this obviously is only going to work if the finances of this can be worked out, but it's nice to, it was a creative solution. And maybe, you know, over time, maybe the patient will become less and less anxious and the appointments can be further spaced out and even discontinued. So 
that's all I have. I wanted to make sure I leave time for questions. So if you do have a question, uh, please type it in the little chat box. Um, and also while this part is, um, while we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to email me. Uh, that's my phone contact. Um, if you have questions about the webinar that you come up with afterwards, feel free to let me know. Okay, so here's a question. Um, please address, based on my case, first case, please address holiday dress code and parties during clinic hours. It's a great question. Thank you for that. You know, I think it's great to have these. Uh, we have them. Um, I think they're important. But I think what you have to be aware of is try and leave some time after, you know, enough time after the last patient before the party starts. And also, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard in a small practice, but I think to, um, you know, try and get people to stay quiet, let them know, hey, we still have a patient. Uh, please keep the noise down until we, um, until the last patient is done. I think most patients on Halloween or, uh, you know, around different holidays, I think that they generally tolerate and even enjoy the costumes. But I think that be proactive. If you have a patient who uh, has a difficult diagnosis or has had a severe complication, I think address it proactively. Just say, well, I can see that you're having a really hard time. I know there were problems after the surgery. I imagine it might be difficult that uh, people are here in costumes for the holiday. You, I'm wondering how that, that is for you. Is it hard to have people celebrating when you're having such a difficult time after your surgery? And again, you know, the costumes are out in the world too, so I, think, I don't think there's any need to not have parties or not um, have costumes, but just be sensitive to that it may be difficult for some patients. So great question. Any other questions? Just wait and see if anything else comes in. I don't see. Okay, here comes another question. Patients often come from other state pra other practices who state they had a surgeon do their procedure who they had not met. How should we reassure them? So I think the question is here again, what happens if a patient is, says, I met my surgeon on the day of the surgery? Um, one, I think I would spend some time asking, just listening to the patient and trying to find out what the question is and, um, and sort of use some sort of teach back. Well, I, if I understand, I want to make sure I understood Sam, what your concerns are. It, it sounds like you were disappointed that you didn't meet the surgeon until the day of surgery. Or are you saying that you don't feel the physician understood why you were having the surgery? So I think really there's no one size fits all here, but really ask the patient what what was missing for them, and, or even say, how would you have liked the surgeon to handle it differently? And then also I think it, th this raises the whole issue of prior care. If patients have concerns about physicians that they saw before you, um, sometimes they're misremembering, sometimes they're misrepresenting, uh, but the best thing is to say, I, I hear that you're really upset about what happened there, the best, you know, it's usually a good idea to talk to the doctor. Did you try talking to that doctor? You don't want to comment on somebody else's care, but if someone asks you a question, like do, do your doctors ever meet someone on the day of surgery, you could say, yes, in fact, they do. If it's, a, you know, if it's an urgent procedure or the patient lives far away and couldn't get in, so just sort of normalize it for them, but really try not to comment on what the, how the prior practice handled it, because it leads to lawsuits. Uh, don't roll your eyes, just don't say, oh my God, are you kidding me? We would never do that. Or, well, that's not the only bad thing we've heard about that practice. You, know, you have to be very careful about that. So again, good question. Um, another question, and by the way, if I didn't answer the first two, um, to, you know, this, uh, please let me know and I can try again. Any other questions here? Okay, so uh, uh, this is a question about the authorization that was lost on the desk, and boy, that's a hard one. I, I don't know if it's any better with electronic health record systems, you know, where you have a queue, where certain, you know, sent, sent to the physician, but I think what helps is to have two things. One is one staff member to have ownership 
and a tracking system. We have a, a document on our website called Noncompliance, and in it there's a tracking system for uh, referrals. Whoops, my screen just went blank. There we go. Uh, a tracking system for referrals, for tests. But I think that whoever is in charge of these uh, needs to track and make sure that, that they, they document that they got this and that it was handled. Now, if you're getting just a ridiculous number of these, this may not be a good solution for you. But I would suggest talking to your group and saying, you know, I heard about this case, what the authorization was lost on the, on the physician's desk. What's, what, what, what can we do in our practice that would work for us to keep that from happening again? But I think often that paperwork, whether it's lab results um, that you know come in and the physician never sees them and they're filed away in the chart, that's led to delay in diagnosis. So all of this paperwork coming at you, you do have to have a good process for making sure that you know you got it, that the appropriate person saw it, and that it's handled in a timely manner. The other thing is that you might uh, regularly tell patients uh, how long you expect things to take. So when you know that you're waiting for authorization, just say, Ann, we're going to um, send in the forms to your insurance company. If you haven't heard back from us in, say, two weeks, whatever a good turnaround time is, please call us again. We, we, you know, sometimes these things can um, get held up. So if you're, you haven't heard back from us to tell you that, yes, it was authorized, please contact us again. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any more coming in. Uh, again, uh, my contact information is there. If you have questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, again, I would encourage you to read that book. Uh, it's really, really helpful uh, for lots of life situations. And I am now going to turn it over to Caitlin to finish up here. But thank you again for participating in the webinar. Thank you, Anne. So as a reminder for everyone, um, an attendance verification certificate will be sent to the attendees of the live webinar by December 4th. And uh, live attendees will now be redirected to an evaluation survey page. Attendees listening to the recording should follow the survey link you received in your confirmation email. All attendees must complete the evaluation in order to receive credits for the webinar. So thank you for joining us, and this concludes our webinar.